Back to our breaking news in the death of Ahmad Arbery. The three men convicted of violating his civil rights are being sentenced today, one after the other. Travis McMichael, who's the man who shot Arbery, was sentenced to life in prison this morning. His father, Greg McMichaels, was also given a life sentence this afternoon. And William Roddy Bryan, who took part in the chase and recorded the shooting, heard his sentence moments to, moments ago, rather, concluding today's hearing. The three men were convicted of federal hate crime charges in February following state convictions in Arbery's murder. Lawyers for the McMichaels are asking to serve out their time in federal custody instead of state prison. But should these killers get their wish? I'm grateful today for our panel of legal experts joining me in studio. First, Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae. I have an Irvin, California prison consultant and author Justin Paperni. And also with me still, criminal defense attorneys Jack Rice and Josh Schiffer. Let's go to you first, Julia. First of all, I know that you are in Brunswick covering this, but you have just learned the most recent news of the sentence in the federal case against William Roddy Bryan. All day it's been the three of these defendants who were going to be hearing their sentences and now we know just in the last couple of moments that <coughs> William Roddy Bryan, the one who filmed all of this, he received 420 months, which is equal to 35 years in prison on the federal side. So similar to what we saw during the state case, he received life in prison while the other two men, Gregory McMichael and Travis McMichael, McMichael, they received life in prison without parole. So with those two life sentences for the father and son in federal court, now we're seeing 35 years for their third co-defendant. And let me ask, um, I'd like to bring you in, Justin, to ask specifically about some of these um, prison in California prison and federal prison, you know that these individuals are asking them, and Michaels through their attorneys are asking that they be in federal prison instead of state prison. First of all, does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me. I read a little while ago, I think the judge ruled that all three would serve time in state prison, which is a blow to them and a win for the prosecution and the family. Generally speaking, a federal prison is gonna have better education, more resources, while not world-class healthcare. Trust me, it's certainly better than you're gonna find in a state prison, lower proclivities for, for violence. So the majority of people have given a chance would choose federal prison. And uh, in this case, it appears as if they're going to endure harder time in a state prison. All right, so Jack, knowing what the sentences are for all three of these in the federal case, knowing what the sentences are in the state case, are you at all surprised? And do you think there's going to be a consideration of moving them to the federal prison system quickly or not? No, they are not. And in fact, there were efforts to plead in the federal case first and the judge rebuffed them. They refused to do it. They wanted that state case to go first. They are going to spend their time in state court, in state prison, and that is a reality. But more important than anything else, there were two prosecutors, not one, but two prosecutors who refused to charge this case out. The idea that they actually went to court, went to trial, and were found guilty in state court, and then went to federal court on top of that for hate crimes is an extraordinary thing and says an enormous thing about the criminal justice system in America. And let's talk about Judge Wood. So this was the judge in the state case, and he issued a statement about the fact that these defendants received a fair trial. So I want to look at that together, and I apologize, this was not the state court, and this is the federal federal court. So let me clarify my mistake. Apologies. It's not lost on the court that it was the kind of trial that Ahmad Arbery did not receive before he was shot and killed. It is a difficult one. Travis will certainly be killed. So it's basically a death sentence, which I'm completely, and let me stop there. I'm apologies. Let me finish the statement and let me clarify for all my viewers that I've now inadvertently confused. Judge Wood is the federal judge who made the statement, it's not lost on the court, that it was the kind of trial that Ahmad Arbery did not receive before he was shot and killed. Julia Janae, comment on that if you would for us, please. Uh, judge Wood uh, had the option at one point of accepting a plea deal between the prosecution and these defendants for this to be uh, 30 years plus in prison for these men and the argument or the request that they be in a federal court. 
uh, this judge said, no deal, I'm not accepting your plea. This is going to go to a trial. So it is a jury that decided on the federal sentence in this case. And you saw there, I think that quote from Lisa Wood, Judge Lisa Wood, is an important one because she's essentially saying that if you think, which is what these defense attorneys argued, that this is piling on, that you shouldn't get a federal uh, trial, federal sentence because you already have a state prison sentence of life in prison. Well, Ahmaud Arbery, that's the kind of trial that he was not given. He was not given a fair trial. You brought guns, you chased him all because you thought he may have committed some kind of uh, a misdemeanor type trespass pass on that property, yet this is the kind of trial you gave him, and that is not a fair one. You got a fair one, and this is what your sentence is. So strong statement by this federal judge. A very strong statement. Josh, let me bring you into this conversation, because you've mentioned before the reality is we know there's going to be an appeal in the state case. Theoretically, there could be a court of appeals that says we're going to reverse this, and that goes away. And if that went away and there was no federal conviction and sentence, they could potentially walk out of jail. Is that right? It, it's correct, but it's very unlikely that they'd ever actually achieve any moment of freedom because of the concurrent issues on top. What I really think is important to notice here is that the defense was forced into a position where they made the mistake, uh, even though it was kind of a forced mistake, of making this where they serve into an issue at all. They then came out and owned the fact that they were trying to manipulate the Department of Corrections of Georgia and the federal system in order to get lighter treatment. And there's not a judge on the bench that is gonna be caught giving some sort of leniency or deference to these three convicted murderers who also got convicted of federal hate crime charges. This is as serious a set of convictions as you get, and no one is gonna stand up uh, for any kind of leniency or easier treatment that guaranteed they weren't ever going to see the federal system. And we know that the reality is that appeal is going to go forward. You just predicted it's going to be very hard to be um, successful on that appeal. So really the only outstanding question is, should they be moved to a federal jail? And I want to bring in some of our viewers' comments in social media. Anne, for instance, says it's a difficult one, TBH. To be honest, Travis will certainly be killed. So it's basically a death sentence, which I'm completely against. I mean, I guess they could have put him in productive custody but is solitary confinement for the rest of your life even legal? I don't know. We also had a social media post from Frank who said, I believe all three should serve their time in state prison. Travis McMichael, most of all, IMO, in my opinion, Travis McMichael should have received the death penalty. Jack, comment on these uh, comments that we've shared from social media, please, sir. The state has an obligation to protect these three men. Flat out, that is the end of the story. That is their obligation. In fact, that's what they are concerned about is the amount of violence in Georgia prisons, but also specifically those who would be targeting them. And so the concern that they've had was saying, if we were in federal custody, we would be protected, whereas in Georgia, we would not be. Georgia has an obligation. They must protect them. And I think that's the concern that they have at this point. All right, so let me bring you back in, Justin, because I know all your expertise as a consultant in California prisons, federal prisons. Do you think that the state may agree then and say, let's protect them by putting them in federal prison where they are going to be safer? Uh, I don't. I think they had hoped initially that they could get it because Derek Chauvin, as you know, is going to a federal prison. So they thought perhaps they'd get lucky as well. I'd agree with what was just said. Their job is security of the institution and keeping costs down. And they know all eyes are going to be on them. So I think it's a mistaken presumption that they're immediately going to be killed within prison. And, and further, we have to embrace the reality that there are going to, as tragic as it sounds, there are going to be those in prison who are going to welcome him, who are going to help him, who are going to help him set up shot shop and protect him. That's an unfortunate reality of state or federal prison. So I wouldn't presume he's going to get killed and all eyes are going to be on them to make sure there are no further problems in these, these state prisons. So I, I suspect he's going to get through it. Okay, not killed, but he's got a lot of years ahead of him to uh, adjust in a way that isn't uh, going to make things harder on him. Protective custody could be an option that has a fundamentally different way to serve time that brings a whole new level of isolation and depression. But that may be the only choice if he fears for his life.
All right, Justin, you really bring to perspective the reality of the feelings and adjusting and the number of years that Travis is going to have in jail to adjust. I want to listen now to uh, Wanda Cooper, Ahmaud Arbery's mother, and what she had to say about an apology. Let's listen together. I was more anxious to see was he going to address the, the parents of Ahmad and also to the family of Ahmad. And Travis chose not to even say that he was sorry. So he is. So it really showed the court, it showed the family, it showed the, everybody who's been saying just for Ahmad what kind of people really took my son away. All right, Julia, you were there covering this firsthand day in, day out. Are you surprised that Travis has not issued an apology? Not surprised. We didn't hear it from him during the state case. We didn't hear that even when he was really on the stand during the state case, which he elected to do out of all of those defendants. Uh, we did hear today from Gregory McMichael, who said that he felt like his words probably meant very little to the family, but he wanted to assure them he never wanted any of it to happen, that there wasn't any malice in his heart. He did show remorse or have an apology for his son the shooter in this case, saying he never wanted his son to be in that kind of position. He apologized for putting him in a position like that that day. I can tell you in the courtroom when I watched these three, you really didn't see any signs of remorse. But when the verdict for Travis, the son, was read by this jury to say that it was guilty, I noticed a difference in Gregory McMichael. His head dropped. He locked eyes with his wife. That's where his remorse lies. You know, and I can understand, I can't even imagine what Wanda Cooper must be feeling to know there's never been an apology for what happened to her own son, but then to hear the father apologize to his son for getting him involved in this.